professional. It's been quite a year for you, for you, hasn't it, with the Spanish Grand Prix being disqualified after you'd won just because your car was, what is it, five-eighths of an inch too wide? That's right, yeah. I mean, we've had a few ups and downs, that being the biggest up and the biggest down of the year so far, all within the space of a couple of hours. I think the, the pace of life in Grand Prix racing now is very heavy, and uh, it is therefore difficult to have a stable home, home life. I, what about I would like to have more of a home life, but uh, as I say, you know, I, I'm in a hurry to prove, to, to prove my point and do what I have to do, and I hope that when I retire, uh, I'm obviously not going to sit down and do nothing for the rest of my life because I'm too energetic a person. But I would like to think that um, I will have burned off a bit of energy and can take a slightly more relaxed approach to life. And I hope that, you know, I'll have enough money not to have, have to work like a fiend from a f financial pressure point of view. I'd like to have a business and do something constructive. Um, but I wouldn't like to be under pressure again. And this is why I'm doing it now because, you know, hopefully when I'm 35 I can get get out of the pressure of life, you know, because I will have done my bit now. It's a question of, you know, how do you want to do it? Do you want to go to steady pace for, for 70 years or whatever, or do you want to go flat out for 10 years and then relax? And I, and I rather like doing it that way. So you're planning to retire at about 35? Well, um, I'm planning to retire when the moment's right, but 30, 35 years old is seven years away for me now, and that's, that's a lot of years in Grand Prix racing, and blame me, if I can't... Uh, can't do what I've got to do within seven years. I don't think I'm going to do it by then. So I hope I will have stopped racing by then. The okay, problem it's... is the big. The, the one problem is that you know it's like uh, you know Graham Hill's situation. Of course, uh, that I like it. I really like driving and I like racing, and so that'll make it difficult to stop. But I hope that I can stop because I'd soon. You know, I would prefer to retire on my feet than on my back. Are you frightened of the idea of dying? And is it something? I, of um, course, everyone must be. But is it something you actually think about when you're driving? Not when you're driving, no. I'm, I'm terrified of dying because uh, I'm having a jolly good time down here. And I really don't, don't want to change it in any way. I don't want to take, take the risk. I don't know what's going to happen when I'm dead, you know. I don't want to take the risk. I'm happy as I am. Um, when actually driving, when it is frightening is when you lie, you know, sit at home and in, in the very serious, sober moments. And I try to have these quite often to think about the thing and say, well, you know, no emotional um, sort of thoughts to influence yourself, like being at a race meeting and under pressure. But just say to yourself, well, look, these are the odds. You know, there is a chance that you can get killed, and there's such and such a chance, maybe, you know, 40% or 50% in your, the rest of your career. Is it worth taking that, that risk? Because when I'm racing, I mean, and I, have, and I then decide, I have always done so far, that it's worth carrying on because there are things that, the odds are stacked me. against you, yeah. Well, there are things, no, the odds are always, they're, they're never as good as, they, as I'd like them to be. Um, but there are things inside me that would make me very difficult to live with myself for the rest of my life if I stopped now. I couldn't do that. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm so near yet so far, and I've got to get that extra bit. Um, but, you know, I will stop when I have to, but when I get to the track, you know, the decision is made. I've decided that I'm continuing for a bit, so there isn't any point in getting worried or getting frightened. I've got plenty of things to think about as it is, and I've got a job to do, and it would be um, restrictive to my driving and unprofessional and generally wrong to start worrying about the danger ele element of it, you know, when one's physically in the car. What's the closest you've been to death? Um, well, I suppose the worst accident I ever had racing was um, at Zandvoort in 1971 when I was driving in Holland. I was driving in a Formula 3 race there, and I tangled wheels with another car in... in in the middle of the track, in fact, and I didn't actually hit anything, but my car just took off the wheels, you know, the tyres going in opposite directions when they touch, so one car gets flipped in the air, which was mine, turned over, and came crashing down, I landed on my head, and was skating along at about 70 or 80 miles an hour in the middle of the track, upside down, and the rollover bar had snapped, so I was being sort of totally squashed in the car, but by various miracles, I was very lucky, and I managed to escape largely unscathed from that, I had a bit of a... This is at Zandvold? Yeah. What were you thinking at the time, and do you ha did you have time to have any emotional reaction to what was happening? Um, no, in, the, in an accident... Well, I did then... I mean, in the accident, you're so busy, everything's going on, there's lots of, sort of noise and it's all happening, and you, you really don't have time to worry. But at that, in that particular accident, I then s slid off the track upside down and landed in, in tall sand dunes there and was up buried upside down in the sand. And um, the Dutch officials 
obviously decided it was wise to contemplate the car for about 40 seconds um, and have a puff on their cigarette just to make sure it wasn't going to catch fire. And they did that because I got photographs to prove that. They're all standing around smoking cigarettes and looking at it. In case it blew up. In case it blew up before they decided it was safe. So I, that 40 seconds was about like, it seemed like 40 minutes. And what was going and through was your mind fun. then? Well, I was worrying that it was going to catch fire. I knew I was perfectly all right. If it didn't catch fire, I could stay there. You know, I was happy to stay there. I mean, I was very uncomfortable. I was being totally squashed. My head was right down in my lap. And uh, I had da slightly damaged vertebrae as a result. Um, and sort of torn muscles in my back. So I wasn't exactly enjoying it. But I knew nothing, no further harm would come to me so long as it didn't catch fire. But I also knew, which was really frightening, that if it did catch fire, they would run in the other direction. I knew that for absolutely for sure. What about the pressures from Susie, from your family, after an accident like that? Is there enormous pressure to try and get you to stop? Well, uh, there never has been. Uh, of course, since, since I uh, met Susie, I'm happy to say that I've been fortunate enough not to have had any sort of serious accident and uh, anything more than a slight sort of bump. And I've uh, been lucky recently in that respect because luck, plays a big part in this and that's what you've got to do it you know believe in I mean obviously one has a lot of there's the skill involved in not having your own accident but the big danger in Grand Prix racing is a, a failure on the car and uh, whilst you know I've got a very very good team behind me the best team probably in that from that point of view they are racing cars are fallible but what well, you, you talked about death James what do you feel about the large number of racing drivers who have in fact killed themselves as a result is it luck? Is it circumstances? Well, it's or is it just those ever-lengthening odds? No, it's mostly circumstances because the 95% of fatal accidents in Grand Prix racing, certainly since 1960, have been caused by problems with the car. And that is, I mean, that's a straightforward scientific fact. And there's a but are you saying that, in fact, both drivers and cars are being pushed beyond the safe limit? No, I'm not saying that. Um, to the limit? No, I don't think so. I think, uh, you see, drivers can make mistakes, but I tell you, I made a mistake in Belgium in practice last weekend, which was... Um, <coughs> but the whole point about the mistake was I wasn't... I did not make the mistake by... Or rather, put it like this, I was trying to go fast at the time, but I wouldn't have gone any quicker if I'd driven in such a way that I would never have made that mistake in the corner. I had a small accident, right? So... With experience, you know this. I mean, and, and one makes very, very few mistakes to top drivers because you don't... Um, going to the limit that's going to cause you a possible accident doesn't make you any quicker around the track. So there's no advantage in driving like that, you see. There's no advantage in... And, plus, and talking about in a race with contact with other cars, there's no advantage in hitting another car because you're able to put yourself out of the race. Have you, is there a sudden social change when you move from one area of racing further up the ladder and one hears about the glamorous world, the parties, the pit lizards, I believe, is the term for racing groupies and all that. I have so is that something that ones. suddenly happens? As you, as you move up? Yeah. Well, the thing is, oddly enough, you know, it's very difficult for me because I don't... I'm rather looking forward to... It's one of the things I look forward to when I retire, then I'll be able to go to all the parties <laughs> and have all the fun because they tend to have that sort of thing, all the, the, the glamour and the, the social thing and things are mainly things that happen at race meetings and things where, quite frankly, when one's driving, one, there's no way you can get involved because, um, I mean, I just wouldn't enjoy it anyway because I'm concentrating on, on the race and it's a total, it is a total concentration thing for about four days. In fact, I, I'm starting building up now already. I start usually on about Tuesday or Wednesday before, about Wednesday before a Grand Prix, I start building up. And to get back to that, James, you, you were talking earlier about the odds and how they lengthen as each day goes by, as another mile of track goes under you, the odds against you are getting higher. Do you think there is an, an inevitable point where if you go on for long enough, you must die? Um, well, I don't think you could say that. Um, but it's just a question. No, as I say, I think one can only say that you know, the more miles you do, the greater the odds lengthen by sheer arithmetic. But what they are, you know, we can't really work out. There's, no, there's really no way of... Um, producing statistics or working these things out. So I really don't know. <coughs> but uh, what I do, as I say, is I'll try and keep my innings reason reasonably short and sensible. And I'll also, as I do already, um, try and contribute constructively to the improvement of safety things in motor racing for, for, for my own benefit 
and also for the benefit of, of people in the future. If you got killed tomorrow, what would you miss most? <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's tricky. <clears throat> I'm not allowed to talk about that on telly. I think. <laughs> and what... I'd miss lots of things, actually. <clears throat> what will you have done that you'll have been most proud of? Um, I will... Well, I'll miss not, not having won the World Championship, that's for sure. Very much so, particularly, you know, if one's... You know, because I feel I'm very near to it now. I don't mean for this year, but in my career, on a, on, on a more overall view, I feel I'm very close to it. I feel I'm very capable of doing it and ready to do it. So that'll upset me that I didn't make it, that I, didn't, that, that, that I was robbed, you know, beaten by the clock, as it were. Um, well, I shall miss all the, all the fun that I have in life. I mean, I have a lot of fun. I mean, I enjoy my work. It's all fun to me, and I enjoy being at home. I enjoy my golf and all the things I do. Are you proud of what you've done so far? Um, well, it's a funny thing, you know, because if you're really candid about it, N I'm not particularly. Um, I mean, I'm not nearly... I mean, when I was, you know, so the four or five years ago when I was looking at Grand Prix drivers then from like this, and I was thinking they were really wonderful people and fantastic thinking. I mean, you know, if I could be... I was thinking if I could be half as good as them, I'd be really proud of myself. And um, I don't know whether... It, I don't know whether it's, it's difficult to get it across, but I'm not particularly, because the thing is, when you can do something well, which presumably I can because of the results, right, you don't feel very clever about it. I mean, do you feel you're doing a very good job interviewing me? You probably don't, because it comes easily to you, you see. But there are lots of people who couldn't do that. Well, it, because I'm lucky enough to have something that comes easily to me, um, you know, it doesn't matter. I feel pleased with myself, actually, when I when I do a really good job that was really hard work, where I really worked for it, right? I do you feel, then, that, that motor racing isn't a particularly worthy sport, that it's just a, a quick means to no, be a No, I think this is applicable to, um, to all walks of life. I think people... Um, I mean, I think p people who are successful in life fall into two categories. Some of them get freaked out with their success and think that they're very clever and get disproportionately... Uh, get a disproportionate view of their own position. And um, I think other people uh, take it in their stride and don't feel especially clever about it. They feel a bit grateful. And, uh, I mean, I think I've put myself into that view. That's not criticising the others or anything. I mean, I, I take advantage of it. Are you a playboy? Um, <laughs> define a playboy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I like playing. <laughs> James, very briefly... You put racing before whatever your parents might have thought of it as a dangerous sport. Mm -hmm. You put it before your marriage. Would you have succeeded if you hadn't been quite that ruthless? No. James Hunt. So. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.